Reenchanting Humanity, a defense of the human spirit against anti-humanism, misanthropy, mysticism, and primitivism, by Murray Bookchin, published by Castle, 1995. Chapter 7 Postmodernist Nihilism The most academically entrenched attack upon humanism, the Enlightenment, and reason are the highly influential philosophical tendencies that go under the name of postmodernism. It is arguable whether this name adequately encompasses such disparate, even idiosyncratic views as those of Friedrich Nietzsche, Martin Heidegger, Michel Foucault, Jacques Derrida and a constellation of former French leftists such as Jean-François Lyotard, Gilles Deleuze, and Jean Baudrillard, to cite the most well-known to an Anglo-American readership. Yet certain basic commonalities, I believe, justly designate their work as postmodernist or post-structuralist, the two words are often used interchangeably. To be sure, Nietzsche and Heidegger belong to a time when anti-enlightenment sentiments were still rooted in the romantic reaction to the effects of the French Revolution and the emergence of industrial capitalism. Although these two thinkers expressed their sentiments in very different tones and formulations, they were alike part of an anti-modernist tradition that dates back to the 19th century and the early part of the 20th. To many elite intellectuals of these generations, the mechanization of society by capitalism and the rise of a growing socialistic working class movement seemed equally repellent alternatives to a vaguely heroic and inspired past. Basically however, Nietzsche and Heidegger advanced philosophies of disillusionment and disenchantment. The world to which Nietzsche spoke was undergoing the cultural transition from a seemingly colorful pre-industrial society to a grey, deadening commercial one. Heidegger, although himself a product of South German Catholic reactionism, found an audience in Weimar-era disillusionment, not only with German imperial pretensions during the Great War but with the pretensions of the socialist movement, which had patently failed to fulfill the promise opened by the Bolshevik Revolution. Despite their differences in style and their different social pedigrees, however, both Nietzsche and Heidegger addressed the fragmentation, anomy, and loss of belief in progress that increasingly troubled intellectuals of their respective times. Although a generation apart, they provided a common cultural field, so to speak, within which later thinkers and journalists found the resources for basically anti-modernist sentiments, especially as additional disillusionments arose in the troubled post-war world of the mid-20th century. The years following the Second World War produced a new sense of failure, particularly in France, which was not really one of the victors in the conflict. Defeated by the Nazis in 1940, France had had to be liberated by mainly Anglo-American armies. Nor was France quite an occupied power like most countries the German armies had taken over in Europe, indeed, given the degree of French coexistence and even collaboration with the Nazis in the early years of the war, Many of its citizens joined the resistance only when it became clear that Germany was destined to lose the war. After the liberation and a brief social honeymoon of national unity, in which leftists, moderates, and conservatives professed to join hands to achieve national rejuvenation, the country was racked by the Cold War policies of its most prestigious party the Communists, by the Third Republic's efforts to retain its holdings in Indochina, by its debacle in Algeria, and in the 1950s, by a Gaullist Fourth Republic that was determined to radically modernize the country at least. Economically. Culturally, French intellectuals tried to relieve the hopeful mood of the liberation days for as long as possible particularly in the form of Jean-Paul Sartre's existentialist philosophy with its strong emphasis on individual autonomy and its professed commitment to humanism. But Sartre and his colleagues had badly misjudged the roots of their largely personalistic philosophy of existence, namely Heidegger and even more absurdly Søren Kierkegaard, whose angst-ridden personalistic theology never found a congenial home among liberal or radical French intellectuals. Although Heidegger himself publicly renounced Sartre's humanistic thrust in his letter on humanism, the German thinker, largely discredited at home because of his Nazi affiliations, had now acquired a Gallic audience for his anti-modernism and anti-rationalism, an audience that was to grow significantly and reach into the English-speaking world. Sartre, in Tum, behaved with the notorious flippancy that was to be the ultimate undoing of his influence in French cultural life.
skipping from Russian communism to Chinese Maoism and thence to various shades of anarchism, the latter, as he professed in the last years of his life, was the abiding basis for his views, he made somewhat of a political buffoon of himself, despite the influence of his humanism among young independent-minded French radicals. No minor factor in shaping the direction of post-war French thinking was the Communist Party which initially seemed to offer a viable foundation for many French intellectuals, who joined it, however temporarily, in considerable numbers. Its enormous influence with the working class, a class that was historically detached from, indeed hostile to France's seemingly effete intellectuals, appeared to offer an earthy alternative to Sartre's existentialist ambiguities. Not that Sartre was oblivious to the social problems of France, quite to the contrary he was the engaged intellectual par excellence, however naive and unstable his politics. But the communists seemed like a pillar of strength beside the café intellectualism that Sartre seemed to embody. The morally rejuvenating and earthy working class to which the communists were tied offered a kind of social and personal therapy to all who fell within the party's orbit. Examining the problems that besieged French intellectuals from the end of the war to the 1960s helps to understand how French postmodernism arose and, more importantly how it acquired its enormous influence. So far as the leftist postmodernists are concerned, such as Lyotard, Deleuze, and Baudrillard, the influence of postmodernism must be related to the aborted student uprising of May-June 1968, particularly in Paris, and the failure of the uprising to enlist the support of the Communist Party which turned upon the students with what seemed to many like counter-revolutionary fury. The student revolt and the working class general strike that erupted in May had nothing to do intellectually with postmodernism, which was still largely unknown even to many politically sophisticated student radicals. The emerging academic stars of the 1960s like Michel Foucault did not directly influence the French student movement and its May-June uprising, or the evenements as they have been called. It was mainly Sartre's humanism, the largely Parisian libertarian socialism of Cornelius Castoriadis's Socialise May OU Barbary group, Guide Aboard Situationists, Henry Lefebvre's critique of everyday life, and an indefinable cultural anarchism that nourished the views held by most of the radical students. Note. For an excellent account of the French thinkers who directly influenced the student movement of May-June, the reader should consult pages 139-56 of Arthur Hirsch, The French New Left, Boston, South End Press, 1981. Hirsch goes a long way in describing the ideological sources of the uprising although he notably omits the influence of the Noir et Rouge group, with whom Daniel Cohn-Bendit was associated, and the Situationists. End note. But the failure of the uprising, together with the decline of the new left generally in Europe and America, opened the way to a nihilistic reaction whose effects are still being felt to this very day. Postmodernism is not only a nihilistic reaction to the failures imputed to Enlightenment ideals of reason, science, and progress but more proximately a cultural reaction to the failures of various socialisms to achieve a rational society in France and elsewhere in our century. This historic failure reached its nadir in the defeat of the May-June events of 1968, which is not to say that all major postmodern thinkers can be so situated in this historical framework and sequence. It may well be that the immediate factors leading to the ascendancy of postmodernism will be forgotten in the future and that postmodernism itself will give way to an even more anti-humanistic reaction in its academic strongholds. But the specific circumstances that catapulted Nietzsche, Heidegger, Foucault, Derrida, et al. to such prominence in the last two decades of the 20th century can be located in the inability of revolutionary movements up to and including the 1960s, to eliminate the massive obstacles that an increasingly industrial and commercial society places in the way of achieving a rational society. Not surprisingly there is a certain symmetry between the emergence of postmodernism as a widely accepted ideology and the emergence of the social circumstances that have made it so widely acceptable. Various societies do foster ideologies that render their pathologies tolerable by mystifying the problems they raise. From the primitive world through the ancient to the medieval, worldviews concomitantly sought to uphold the hegemony of those in power and to explain the crises that unsettled those eras.
but they also took on a cathartically rebellious form against the established social order. Early Christianity like Mitraism before it and the Reformation later on, is a striking case in point. Today's market society is no exception to this rule. The very tendency of mature capitalism to fragment traditional social and cultural relations by means of commodification yields reactionary cultural sacula of its own, specifically a consolidating ideology that holds the mind captive to the social order in the very name of fragmentation and its alleged virtues. If the social order cannot make a virtue out of hope, it can try to make a virtue out of despair. I am not claiming that postmodernists necessarily bear a personal intention of becoming ideological supports for any social system or that they are the mere creatures of capital. But what makes any given body of ideas acceptable or academically respectable more often has to do with the social functions it serves rather than with the quality of the insights it offers. Indeed, Many of the insights that have made postmodernism so attractive are not very new and have been recycled, often unknowingly, from a warehouse of Western and even Eastern ideas that were available in various forms for several centuries, indeed several millennia. The more one feels disempowered about the human condition and bereft of social commitment, the more one becomes cynical and thereby captive to the prevailing social order. To the extent that hope and belief in progress are lost, a disarming relativism, a historicism, and ultimately nihilism replace any belief in the objectivity of truth, the reality of history, and the power of reason to change the world. Beliefs that foster social quietism and a withdrawal into personal life, in turn, tend to neutralize an activist and interventionist mentality oriented toward the public sphere. By contending that reason is questionable as a path to ascertaining truth, indeed that it is simply a social artifact and that truth is merely a social artifice, postmodernism advances this process, as does its denial that an objective history exists, a denial that divests the present of any ethical moorings and social meaning. Civilization ceases to be regarded as a realm of rational attainments, indeed the very idea of progress as a basis for hope and social foresight begins to fade, if not disappear completely. Moreover, such sweeping claims tend to obscure the social factors that have created the postmodern condition, to use Jean-Francois Lyotard's phrase, in fact, by rendering social analysis anemic, even bloodless, postmodernism tends to underpin the status quo precisely by challenging its effects rather than its underlying workings. Considerations of space make it impossible for me to explore postmodernism generally still less provide an exposition of its ever-changing, even convoluted ideas. Rather, I shall confine myself to examining those aspects of postmodernism that are anti-humanist in the sense I am using the word in this book, as subverting a belief in the power of reason, science, and technology to render society and the human experience rational and free. Within this delimited scope, Postmodernism can clearly be seen as a fragmenting and relativizing ideology par excellence that reflects the enemy and despair so widespread in the closing years of the century. In this respect postmodernism, precisely because it is a weary and nihilistic body of ideas, may very well serve to validate the present society or even render it possible for its acolytes to dwell rather innocuously within the existing set of social conditions, however much they regard themselves as social rebels, especially concerning issues that do not challenge the structure of the present society. Its denigration of reason, coherence, and historicism, can hardly provide a sense of direction for popular restiveness or the intellectual means for contesting the anti-ecological and multinational capitalism of our time, still less provide the basis for a serious project for social change. Rather, it more often leads to a pervasive relativism and to a dismembering of the universalist projects initiated by Enlightenment thinkers and their more radical descendants, so as to produce a form of social myopia. Put bluntly, it disarms all serious oppositional tendencies toward the prevailing society apart from the narcissistic adventures of mere personal rebellion in dealing with the frustrations the society arouses in oppressed but marginal cultural groups. To understand how this often socially deflective approach of postmodernism has emerged, we must look, if only cursorily, into the proximate ancestors of the postmodern outlook and the way they provided the premises for the devaluation of all values, 
rather than responding seriously to Friedrich Nietzsche's call for a transvaluation of all values. That Nietzsche's name appears in nearly every discussion of postmodernism is by no means accidental. Indeed, he has been embraced by otherwise opposing theorists across the philosophical and political spectrums, even before his death in 1900, with an enthusiasm that is little less than extraordinary the extent of his influence today has few precedents, with the exception of Kant, Hegel, and Marx. Until fairly recently Nietzsche's name conjured up an elitist belief in a superman, a hatred of Christianity and corrosive attacks on socialism, democracy, and the slavish masses or herd. Indeed, his philosophy was seen as ideological furniture for the various reactionary beliefs that flourished in his time and that came to terrifying fruition in our own century. The favorable recognition he received from rabid reactionaries, and even the imprimatur of the Nazis on his writings, as edited by his reactionary anti-Semitic sister, Elizabeth Forster, Nietzsche, together with a personal visit by Hitler to the Nietzsche archives, reinforced the belief that Nietzsche was a precursor of National Socialism. Yet Nietzsche's proclivity for slapping the face of bourgeois Philistines earned him encomiums from socialists and anarchists as well. Radicals of all kinds delighted in his militant individualism, with its kinship to the ideas of the alleged anarchist Max Stirner. He enjoyed great popularity among militant syndicalists, such as Salvador Segui, a leader of the Spanish Syndicalist Union, the National Confederation of Labor, CNT, and the anarchist, Emma Goldman, who praised his vibrant iconoclasm and hatred of the German state, as did socialists like Jack London. Many Marxists solidarized with Nietzsche's biting criticisms of bourgeois mean-spiritedness and vulgarity, while the father of Zionism, Theodor Herzl, admired his strident contempt for anti-Semites and the praises he heaped on the Jews. That Nietzsche was neither a German nationalist nor an anti-Semite, as so many supposed, no longer requires elucidation today. He was indeed individualist, and abiding critic of mass culture and the slave mentality inculcated in the herd by Christianity. His broader philosophical notions of the Ubermensch, of eternal recurrence, of life as the will to power, and his personal values shall not concern us here. Nietzsche's thinking provides a base for postmodernist thought in that, more brilliantly than any other writer of the last century he made relativism a pivotal tenet of his outlook. By doing so, he called into question all the seeming certainties of traditional philosophies based on objective truth. Not that he denied the existence of an objective world, or, more properly even cared very earnestly to discuss this traditional philosophical question, the most important conclusion he drew from his relativism was his reduction of facts to interpretations with no objective validity of their own. His views thereby seemed to permit the freedom to shuffle opinions around without concern for whether they are verifiable independently of the observer who formulates them. Nietzsche's agnosticism, if such it can be called, implied that it is meaningless to speak of an objective realm in which values, theories, and experience can be based. This relativism or perspectivism, as Nietzsche called his view, is built on Gustav Teichmuller's notion that every body of ideas is a simple partial, and incomplete perspective on a highly complex world. Each view of the world, for Teichmuller, was equally valid with any other, a pivotal contribution to postmodern thinking, although his views are rarely, if ever discussed these days. Yet his approach that any body of ideas is partial, indeed that it contributes to an increasingly broader understanding of reality, was hardly new, Hegel, and much earlier Aristotle assumed such a perspectivist approach to the philosophical views that preceded their own. Moreover, Teichmuller assumed that there is a reality however complex and unfathomable, that is beyond mere interpretation, and that it can be known by reason as well as by experience. Nietzsche questions this traditional conclusion. In a posthumously published fragment he asks, quote, What then is truth? A mobile army of metaphors, metonyms, and anthropomorphisms, in short, a sum of human relations, which, have been enhanced, transposed, and embellished poetically and rhetorically, and which after long use seem firm canonical, and obligatory to a people, truths are illusions about which one has forgotten this is what they are, metaphors which are worn out and without sensuous power,
coins which have lost their pictures and now matter only as metal, no longer as coins? End quote. Note. Friedrich Nietzsche, on truth and lie in an extra moral sense, from the portable Nietzsche, edited and translated by Walter Kaufman, New York, Viking Portable Library, 1959, pages 46 to 7. End note. By omitting the certainties of truth from his discussion, Nietzsche presents a radical relativism, a subjective, even linguistic relativism, that has entered into postmodernism with a vengeance. Thus, quote, Against positivism, which halts at phenomena, there are only acts, I would say, and a facts are precisely what there is not, only interpretations. We cannot establish any fact in itself. Everything is subjective, you say, but even this is interpretation. The subject is not something given, it is something added and invented and projected behind what there is. Finally is it necessary to posit an interpreter behind the interpretations. Even this is invention, hypothesis. End quote. Note. Friedrich Nietzsche, The Will to Power, Translation Walter Kaufman and R.J. Hollingdale, New York, Random House 1967, p. 267. End note. None of these statements prevent Nietzsche, in principle from me exercising the privilege of saying as much as he cares to say about ideas and reality least of all within the very philosophical realm he professes to reject. He even has a full philosophy by no means far removed from the metaphysics he denounces. Nietzsche presents his perspectives, such as his notion of eternal recurrence, as though they have subjective validity or facticity. Notwithstanding recent attempts to I, at h euro.er this notion a metaphoric quality Nietzsche himself actually wanted to study the natural sciences to find ontological evidence for this cyclical belief although a number of Nietzsche's failings, arguably, were criticized by Heidegger and later by postmodernists, his lasting imprint on postmodernist thought cannot be ignored. By reducing truth to linguistic traditions and facts to interpretations, he provides postmodernists with the means, as well as the stylistic brilliance and fervent militancy, to radically subjectivize truth and facts, and to deny the validity of any objective concept of history as universalistic, indeed as more than a disjointed, variable, and free-floating collection of narratives. The same fragmenting and seemingly subversive strategy could also be applied to science, reason, the subject, and social theory, all of which postmodernists were to cast as specific social or even personal creations. In a harsh deprecation of man and reason, Nietzsche regales us with the fable of an inconsequential star on which clever animals invented knowledge during the haughtiest and most mendacious minute of world history yet only a minute in cosmic time, after which the star grew cold, and the clever animals had to die. Nor does the fable sufficiently illustrate, as Nietzsche puts it, how wretched, how shadowy, and flighty, how aimless and arbitrary the human intellect appears in nature. There have been eternities when it did not exist, and when it is done for again, nothing have happened. There is nothing in nature so despicable or insignificant that it cannot immediately be blown up like a bag by a slight breath of this power of knowledge. Note. Nietzsche, On Truth and Lie, p. 42. End note. Will Nietzsche's explicit depreciation of humanity his denigration of reason, and his view of truth as little more than metaphor reverberated among many reactionaries who followed him, people whom he probably would have denounced as Reich's mention, as he was to designate Richard Viogenier for surrendering to German nationalism. His idiosyncratic mind and his brilliant style lures us too easily into his literary orbit and mystifies us with pithy and colorful generalizations. Yet the misanthropic attitudes that underpin so much of his thought should not be ignored. Nietzsche was no angel, arid to his credit, he would have despised anyone who called him one. His irascibility at once coaxing and bullying, self-certain and contradictory, may account for the ability of his books to speak to a very broad spectrum of thinkers at different times. As criticism of the late Victorian world whose philistinism infected Germany no less than England, his work is sparkling when it is not recklessly self-adulatory. <laughs>
waves of metaphors and an unrelenting linguistic brilliance carry the reader away. That his works were taken seriously during a period of social reaction some 70 or 80 years after his death, and elicited a vast number of commentaries on him as one of the three most influential philosophers of our era, side by side with Marx and Freud, is not surprising. Social reaction breeds cultural decadence, and the most articulate academic critics of that decadence, drawn in great part from a disillusioned French left, came to be among the most compelling symptoms of decadence itself what filiations do postmodernists claim with Nietzsche, and what have they added to his putative insights. Certainly Nietzsche's immediate indeed programmatic contribution is his perspectivism, his radical if under-theorized relativism. To this we must add his candid anti-rationalism, his linguistic interpretation of facticity his denial of objectivity and his view of the subject as something invented and projected behind what there is, even to the point where he challenges the existence of an interpreter behind the interpretation. Not only are these paradoxes dizzying, but Nietzsche himself was hardly prone to deny that they existed unresolved. In the Paris of the 1950s and early 1960s, however, post-structuralist and later post-modernist intellectuals were not disciplined readers of earlier philosophers and tended to glide over such paradoxes, which often verge on outright contradictions. In fact, they even celebrated, when it was opportune, the needed ambiguities that challenge the so-called logocentric thinking of modernity and humanism. The most important of French post-war philosophers to claim the direct heritage of Nietzsche and stylistically the most bewitching was Michel Foucault. Eschewing labels like postmodernism, he simply declared, I am a Nietzschean, shortly before his death in 1984, and with wry humor he deprecated postmodernism as a fad. Although Foucault earned a growing audience with his early works and some distinction as a thinker inside France, he really catapulted into the public eye after the May-June events. Note. I made two fairly lengthy visits to Paris in the autumn of 1967 and in mid-July 1968, when street fighting occurred throughout the capital on the evening before Bastille Day. During that time I interviewed several student activists in great detail, most of whom played leading roles in the March 22nd movement, which spearheaded the student struggle. When I asked about their philosophical and political influences, they made frequent references to the Socialise Mayou Barbaric group, the Anarchist Noir Et Rouge group, and even to the Situationists, whom they viewed with a certain measure of disdain because of their withdrawal from the movement. But no one I interviewed mentioned Foucault. Eager as I was to explore the ideological influences on the student movement, I did not even learn of Foucault's existence until he became fashionable in the United States years later. End note. Foucault's readership grew with the publication of Madness and Civilization in France in 1961 and its translation in an abridged form into English in 1963, followed by his best-selling The Order of Things in 1965. Yet his work seemed no more relevant to the radical culture of the time than Norman Zero. Brown's Life Against Death to which it was compared in a New York Times book review. His reputation swelled with the publication of Discipline and Punish. In 1975, followed by its translation into English within two years. In the nine years that remained to him, Foucault became one of the most lionized, sought after, and acclaimed intellectuals on the academic scene, not only in France but in the United States. By the dash point 1980s many critics hailed him as the greatest thinker of the late 20th century. Why this enormous acclaim for a historian whose work is often anecdotal and who as a speculative thinker is not very searching? Foucault owes a great deal of his immense reputation to the failure of 1968 and its aftermath, not to any role he played as an initiator of or even a major influence on the May-June events. His books unquestionably speak to an intellectual need associated with the evenements, the critique of power, the ideology of the traditional left, and the celebration of marginalized lifestyles. He is deeply concerned with the masked forms of domination in everyday life that rarely reach the level of ordinary consciousness. In this respect he often followed paths reconnoitered by Henry Lefebvre, who pioneered the study of everyday life, LEQ 11 Odity 11. As far back as the 1940s.
Moreover, many of his readers saw Foucault's bouquets as critiques of civilization as such and of any belief in progress, a view that was to come very much into vogue in the 70s and the decades that followed. Note. On the multilayered genealogy of Foucault's ideas and all their convolutions, see James Miller's superb The Passion of Michel Foucault, New York, Simon and Schuster, 1993, a respectful but critical account that in many respects contains an implicit criticism of our times and explores the philosophical milieu in which Foucault's views were developed. End note. Foucault is above all a chronicler of domination, regarded by many of his readers, all his excursions into language and the human sciences notwithstanding, indeed, many present-day Parisians see him primarily as a historian, not as a philosopher. In the early and mid-1970s, Foucault's critique of domination, if by no means original, seemed particularly appropriate. The 1968 student uprising in Paris had been not only a revolt against the myth that socialism existed in Stalinist Russia but evidence of a growing sensitivity on the part of French academics to youth subcultures that placed an expanded interpretation of selfhood on the agenda of social liberation. In this respect the new left initially stood in marked contrast to the economistic doctrines of the old left which in France, at least, was still organized into powerful parties. Freedom and domination seemed to acquire a broader meaning than they had had in the past, especially when colored by radical aestheticism steeped in Dadaist and surrealist traditions rather than in Marxist or communist ones. Understandably the failure of the Meijun revolt did not diminish the new fascination with largely cultural interpretations of social development. Quite to the contrary, radicals of nearly all kinds saw a need for studies of concrete forms of domination, for investigations into the oppressive dimensions of everyday life, whether in the past or the present, indeed. For accounts of subjugation and coercion that eschewed grand, seemingly abstract, and finalistic theories about history and the future of society. Foucault's critique of domination and power now became increasingly popular, it managed to satisfy these needs in varying degrees, earning considerable and in France, popular acclaim. Not only did his books, interviews, and lectures describe oppressions that ordinarily take the form of rational and humane dispensations, such as asylums that profess to treat the insane and prisons that profess to rehabilitate their inmates, his criticisms of domination and power were ubiquitous, extending from asylums and prisons to the most minute features of everyday life. Moreover, whatever he intended his work to achieve, Foucault attacked institutions as such. In one of his most interesting dialogues, with the Maoist, Pierre Victor, he defends the 1792 September massacres during the French Revolution, in which seemingly uncontrolled crowds, fearing internal enemies of the revolution, brutally killed thousands of prisoners in the jails of the Paris area, most of the latter were not political prisoners but prostitutes, debtors, and minor malefactors. The massacres Foucault declares were a political act against the manipulation of those in power, and an act of vengeance against the oppressive classes. He favorably contrasts this popular justice executed by a crowd with the institutionalized authoritarian manner in which the Paris Commune of 1792, quote, set about staging a court, judges behind a table representing a third party standing between the people who were screaming for vengeance, and the accused who were either guilty or innocent, an investigation to establish the truth or to obtain a confession, deliberation in order to find out what was just. Can we not see the embryonic, albeit fragile form of a state apparatus reappearing here? End quote. Note. Michel Foucault, Power Slash Knowledge, Selected Interviews and Other Writings, 1972-77, Translation Colin Gordon et al. New York, Pantheon Books, 1980, pages 1-2. End note. This passage is plainly directed against institutionalization in any form, as though the crowd's behavior were entirely spontaneous, which it probably was not, and the commune's creation of an ad hoc court constituted an embryonic state apparatus, which it did not, under the circumstances.
Lacking any searching theoretical or historical contextuality Foucault's statements on the profoundly important issue of just treatment for criminal behavior are completely reckless and only seemingly radical. To see an embryonic state power in institutionalized human interaction, even in its strictly functional and ad hoc forms, is as simplistic as it is misleading. Carried to its logical conclusion, Foucault's view essentially excludes the possibility that any kind of society can exist without domination, unless it is a freewheeling mass of individuals who somehow congeal into functional bodies like the September crowds. That the arbitrariness of crowd actions may undermine the imperatives of organized and rational human behavior seems to have been under-theorized at best or barely reached the level of conscious formulation at worst. Foucault's anecdotal and almost microscopic treatment of power notwithstanding, his very endeavor to show its ubiquity in fact makes power too cosmic and elusive to grasp. We know the details of power, often quite marginal details, but we do not know the premises and the structure of power, notably the crucial social relations that underpin it. Seen only as the exercise of coercion, which the crowds of September 1792 certainly exercised, power becomes too ubiquitous to cope with. It is everywhere, and, functionally, beyond comprehension, however much it may vary in degrees or be concentrated by institutions. There is no good reason why the September massacre crowds that brutally slaughtered the prisoners were more free or desirable than a court set up by the Paris Commune to sift enemies of the revolution from petty criminals. More specifically power itself is not something whose elimination is actually possible. Hierarchy domination, and classes can and should be eliminated, as should the use of power to force people to act against their will. But the liberatory use of power, the empowerment of the disempowered, is indispensable for creating a society based on self-management and the need for social responsibility, in short, free institutions. It seems inconceivable that people could have a free society both as social and personal beings, without claiming power, institutionalizing it for common and rationally guided ends, and intervening in the natural world to meet rational needs. Foucault's opposition to institutions as such significantly impairs his critique of power. Not only does the substantial and formal exercise of power vex him, institutionalization in all forms is so integrally related to the exercise of power that his critique is completely reductionist, which is to say vacuously abstract. Institutions are part of even the simplest of human affiliations, be they families, clans, tribes, or municipalities of one kind or another, not to speak of the multitude of establishments human beings require simply to have a society. Thus, Foucault exhibits little or no concern about the nature of power. His pseudo-libertarian approach is ultimately so sweeping as to verge on extreme individualism. No distinction is made between power held by state institutions and power claimed by popular institutions or between institutions that lead to tyranny and those that lead to freedom. Not surprisingly Foucault, a political activist in his own way, was committed to episodic events, to demonstrations, protests, battles with the police, in short, to discontinuous occurrences, local situations that are entirely ephemeral, that come and go in the flux of mere events and never lead to the formation of broad social movements. Advancing no constructive structural analysis of power as such, Foucault offers no remedies for social change beyond the impact of incidents, tumultuous at best and passive at worst. Like a gnomic wanderer with a taste for the marginal, Foucault searches historical accounts with an eye for the cryptic episode, the mythic, the masked, indeed, the irrational, of which he is not a critic in principle but a celebrant, living below the level of conscious, forthright exploration. If Nietzsche declared that God is dead, Foucault announces the end of man, but where Nietzsche was militant in his pronouncement, Foucault is hazy and elliptical. The often convoluted prose of the order of things, with its emphasis on the ontogenetic role of language, tells us little more than what Nietzsche was to say in his affirmation of human ephemerality. Indeed, using language mythopoeically with a sense of private mystery, Foucault announces humanity's burial, quote. Thus, the last man is at the same time older and yet younger than the death of God, since he has killed God, it is he himself who must answer for his own finitude, 
but since it is in the death of God that he speaks, thinks, and exists, his murder itself is doomed to die, new gods, the same gods, are already swelling the future ocean, man will disappear. Rather than the death of God, or, rather, in the wake of that death and in profound correlation with it, what Nietzsche's thought heralds is the end of his murderer, it is the explosion of man's face in laughter, and the return of the masks. End quote. Note. Michel Foucault, The Order of Things, New York, Vintage Books, 1973, p. 385. The editor of the series in which Foucault's work appeared was R.D. Lang. End note. This is a singularly reactionary statement. It heralds the coming of new gods, the same gods in the future ocean, and with its quasi-mystical and ambiguous prose it epitomizes Foucault's rejection of the Enlightenment, which tried to eliminate God from the human condition and bring humanity face to face with itself and with reality by removing its mythic masks. In the Nietzschean myth of eternal recurrence, as Foucault seems to see it, the death of God prepares the way not only for the end of man, but for the return of other gods and atavistic masks, if not the physical destruction of humanity itself in a nuclear holocaust. As for truth, Foucault declares that it, quote, isn't outside power, lacking in power contrary to a myth whose history and functions would repay further study truth isn't the reward of free spirits, the child of protracted solitude, nor the privilege of those who have succeeded in liberating themselves. Truth is a thing of this world, it is produced only by virtue of multiple forms of constraint. And it induces regular effects of power. Each society has its regime of truth, its general politics of truth, that is, the types of discourse which it accepts and makes function as true, the mechanisms and instances which enable one to distinguish true and false statements, the means by which each is sanctioned, the techniques and procedures accorded value in the acquisition of truth, the status of those who are charged with saying what counts as true. End quote. Note. Foucault, Power Slash Knowledge, p. 131. End note. Foucault, in effect, escalates Nietzsche's own perspectivism without adding any dialectic of truth, of knowledge, of thought, and least of all of history. The reader is left with only the impoverished relativism of a fixed time and place, of power in all its masks. History appears as data organized into regimes of truth, each of which is essentially hermetic and self-enclosed. Given these specific regimes of truth, social freedom is essentially impossible because power, as exercised by these regimes, is integral to social life as such. The regimes of truth do depend to one degree or another on each other, in the form of shredded hand-me-downs, not as a developing continuum, let alone a universalistic one. There is enough in Foucault's often equivocal and cryptic writings to suggest that he denies the possibility that we can actually attain social liberation. We may resist the social order perhaps, but only in the defensive actions of local insurrections, as Foucault calls them. We can defy protest, strike a blow against the all-embracing authority of regimes of truth, but a radical breach with the established order and its replacement with a truly liberated one is precluded by the premise that social life and its indispensable institutionalization is essentially a system of subordination and domination that we merely reinscribe when we try to replace one social form with another. Note. In his last works, particularly the brief essay Subject and Power, Foucault declared that it is not power, but the subject, which is the general themes of my current research. For him this shift was meant to expand the dimensions of a definition of power if one wanted to use this definition in studying the objectivizing of the subject. Did this change in focus denote any emancipatory intention? Maybe the target nowadays is not to discover what we are, but to refuse what we are. We have to promote new forms of subjectivity through the refusal of this dominated and domineering kind of individuality which has been imposed on us for several centuries. These passages are cited in Hubert L. Dreyfus and Paul Rubinow, Michel Foucault, Beyond Structuralism and Hermeneutics, 2nd ed. Chicago, University of Chicago Press, 1983, pages 209, 21.6.
Foucault's call for a refusal to be what the system wants us to be and to resist its hold upon us while promoting new forms of subjectivity arose early in the 1960s, only, alas, to be subsequently absorbed into the prevailing order as a cult of narcissism. Hence the crucial need for changing society not ourselves alone. End note. There can be little doubt that Foucault was a humane man, viscerally concerned about the injustices that existed in the world, and frequently prepared to act militantly in defense of human rights. But he offers no basic philosophy for his actions and in many ways vitiates the emergence of one. As a critic of power he in fact leaves us quite powerless to change our fate, and foresees, along with Nietzsche, not only the end of God but the end of man. His explicit anti-humanism, his rejection of the potentialities opened by the Enlightenment, his ahistoricism, and his treatment of truth as a regime of domination are too debilitating in their social effects to support the image of the engaged French intellectual. He drifted from Stalinism to Maoism to a lifestyle anarchism more properly nihilism, within a span of only two decades. It is as a defining thinker of post-structuralism and post-modernism that his basic ideas are of concern here. A variety of thinkers who emerged along with Foucault in the early 1960s and flourished after the collapse of the 1968 events laid the basis for what is now generically called postmodernism. The most notable of this group are Jacques Derrida, Jean-François Lyotard, Gilles Deleuze, and Félix Guattari, and Jean Baudrillard, several of whom made their careers in the United States as well as France. Not all of these writers accept a postmodernist label, but their work rarely justifies this disclaimer and all of them, without exception, can validly be regarded as bitter opponents of the ensemble of ideas I have called enlightened humanism. Apart from Foucault, the most widely known of the group is Jacques Derrida, a French Algerian of Sephardic Jewish ancestry, whose books, articles, and lectures have had an enormous influence in Anglo-American universities. And it is with Derrida and his intellectual grounding that we will be principally concerned in most of the pages that follow. If Foucault expressly placed himself in the tradition of Nietzsche, Derrida places himself in the tradition of the later Heidegger. The extent to which these two traditions can in fact be clearly distinguished from each other is arguable, Nietzsche could have nourished both French thinkers in formulating their many common and defining views. As we have seen, he had already abolished the subject, or interpretator, the objectivity of truth, and the significance of humanity in the cosmic nature of things. These are major motifs in both Foucault and Derrida. But Derrida himself has insisted upon his filiations with, and transcendence of, Heidegger, particularly in the closing pages of The Ends of Man and in his Of Spirit, and there is no reason why we should not take him at his word as well as acknowledge his reservations. Note. Jacques Derrida, The Ends of Man, In Margins of Philosophy, Chicago, University of Chicago Press, 1982, pages 123-34, and Jacques Derrida, Of Spirit, Heidegger and the Question, Chicago, University of Chicago Press, 1989. End note. Today's academic investment in Heidegger, as well as in Foucault and Derrida, is so immense that anyone who challenges Heidegger's status as the greatest philosopher of the 20th century risks garnering opprobrium verging on defamation. Yet the emperor, in fact, is wearing very few clothes indeed. Far from being a significant philosopher, Martin Heidegger is not only grossly overrated as a thinker but he is one of the most reactionary on the spectrum of Velton's chunk thought. More pretentious and mystical than his acolytes are prone to acknowledge, Heidegger was a product of South German provincialism. Note. Stefan Skamansky's description of the master is all the more interesting because it is written by a swooning disciple. After celebrating the fact that Heidegger never left Meskirch, in which he was born, even after receiving an invitation from the Führer to visit him in Berlin in 1935, actually, he traveled widely both on his own and for the Nazis, Skamansky tells us that to meet with Heidegger he had to drive for an hour to the small town of Tatna in the Black Forest Mountains and then to climb a path to the top of a mountain, where he lived under primitive conditions with few books and a stack of writing paper. 
the philosopher was dressed in the costume of a Swabian peasant, a dress he often also used to wear when he was rector of Freiburg University. His heavy, squarish skiing boots, it was summer, emphasized still more strongly his relationship to the soil, and his brother still farms in the region. More than one writer has alluded to Heidegger as a peasant philosopher, without stressing the provincialism this implies. As to whether wearing ski boots in the summertime was sheer affectation or evidence of Heidegger's relationship to the soil, the reader will have to decide. See Stefan Skamansky's foreword to Martin Heidegger, Existence and Being, Chicago, Henry Regnerico, 1949, pages 9x. End note. The trajectory of his ideas from the 1920s to his last works in the 1970s situates him in what Fritz Stern has called a cool to religion that, quote, embraced nationalism, for it insisted on the identity of German idealism and nationalism. The essence of the German nation was expressed in its spirit, revealed by its artists and thinkers, and at times still reflected in the life of the simple unspoiled folk. Common were the lamentations about the decline of the German spirit, the defeat of idealism by the forces of realism in politics and of materialism in business. End quote. Note. Fritz Stern, The Politics of Cultural Despair, A Study in the Rise of the Germanic Ideology, Berkeley, University of California L. Press, 1974, p. XXVIC also George Massey, The Crisis of German Ideology, Intellectual Origins of Tyre Third Reich, New York, Grosset and Dunlap, 1964. End note. Although he was initially trained in theology Heidegger's 1920s writings retain a secularity that probably stemmed from his training with Edmund Husserl, the distinguished father of modern phenomenology, who called upon philosophers to remove the multitude of assumptions that overlie direct access to the facts, an appeal that ended, oddly enough, in a variant of idealism rather than empiricism. As Husserl's assistant and his chosen successor at the University of Freiburg, Heidegger, far from going back to the facts, essentially mystified them. In his Being and Time, 1927, the work that made his reputation in Germany and abroad and that he dedicated to Husserl in friendship and admiration, Heidegger's jargon freight psychological notions with an ontological perspective that only superficially resembles ontology as an inquiry into the nature of reality. In fact, Heidegger essentially intellectualized his regional provincialism and reactionism into a metaphysical psychology, much more than a philosophy and made intellectual history by transforming moods and sentiments into categories. The work for which he is still best known, Being and Time, published in 1927, found a ready audience in Germany particularly among young people and academic mandarins afflicted by the alienation, cultural pessimism and Weltschmerz of the Weimar era. Heidegger professed to break, root and branch, with what he took to be 2,500 years of Western philosophical thought, that is to say, in fact, with traditional ontology itself far from producing a new ontology he subverted ontology by using traditional categories like being and time to radically redefine its appropriate concerns. From Plato's time onward, Heidegger contended, Ontology had steadily focused on an elaboration of the ultimate foundations of temporal phenomena, be those foundations Platonic forms, Aristotelian substance, the Cartesian subject, materialism's matter, or contemporary science's energy. Heidegger's complaint, let me emphasize, is not worth a pfennig as criticism, for these traditional foci were and still should be the real concerns of ontology regardless of whether one agrees with a specific ontological view such as Plato's or Descartes. But for Heidegger, this line of thought has concealed or lost contact with what it means for phenomena to be. It straitjackets isness or being, sen, in rational categories, instead of letting specific beings or entities, seen, simply be or manifest themselves for what they really are. In the course of this concealment, human beings become separated from being, indeed, from things themselves, and they develop a productivist mentality that views entities as mere objects for human use. Heidegger reduces ontology to a form of cultural and psychological criticism, 
overlaid by a verbiage that restates the ontological concept of being as self-realization rather than reality in all its forms and characteristics. In our own time, according to Heidegger, we are totally enveloped by a manipulative and technocratic attitude toward things, such that, divested from our contact with being, we are left on our own, leading inauthentic lives in which we dread our own finiteness and mortality. Far from heroically affirming the certainty of death and becoming authentic in our affirmation of our humanness, or Dasein, literally, being there, with its wealth of possibilities, we have disengaged ourselves from nature and retreated into the crude materialism and everyday trivialities that occupy the lives of what Heidegger calls the they, Das man, or, equivalently, what Nietzsche called the herd. We are permeated by angst, thrown into a world that is marked by ambiguity, idle talk, a falling, verfallen, of Dasein into the herd-like world that renders our being in the world, which Heidegger designates as the basic state of Dasein, increasingly inauthentic, unagent lich. Being and time essentially borrows themes from Søren Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, and anti-enlightenment ideas from German Romantic conservatives to explicate our fall or falling from authenticity to inauthenticity, using a metaphysical terminology that transforms verbs into nouns. To fall, for example is a verb, loaded with religious meaning, but it is hard to say what it signifies when it is turned into the metaphysical noun falling, as is the case with thrownness, which essentially deals with the fact that we do not create the world in which we find ourselves. It is clear from a reading of being and time that we have been falling for some time, now, and yet Heidegger's use of the term suggests a quasi-religious descent that the Bible encapsulated into a single event. Be that as it may, it is hard to avoid the feeling that Heidegger's falling is a secular version of the biblical fall and includes the penalty as we shall see, of a loss for which we are or have been paying a grave, almost apocalyptic penalty in his later works. Nor does Heidegger always provide us with clear formulations that have, in fact, been stated more succinctly by other thinkers before him. Consider the following dense statement in Being and Time, even if Dasein is assured in its belief about its wither, we are told, all this counts for nothing as against the phenomenal facts of the case, for the mood brings Dasein before the that it is of its there, which, as such, stares it in the face with the inexorability of an enigma. Note. Martin Heidegger, Being and Time, Translation John McQuarrie and Edward Robinson, New York, Harper and Row, 1962, p. 175. End note. Allow me to suggest that this is overloaded verbiage for a condition that Marx, for example noted more pithily when he wrote, men make their own history, but they do not make it just as they please, they do not make it under circumstances chosen by themselves, but under circumstances directly encountered, given, and transmitted by the past. Note. Karl Marx, the 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon, in Selected Works, Volume 1, Moscow, Progress Publishers, 1969, p. 398 End note. It is necessary to tear off Heidegger's linguistic mask, one that hides the authentic face of postmodernism generally, if we are to get to the essentials of the Heidegger-Derrida connection. The ease with which Heidegger's language permits him to engage in circular reasoning, his typically mystical recourse to silence as the mode of discourse for conscience, his contradictory emphasis on personalism on the one hand and the subordination of individual inclinations to the collective destiny of the Volk, on the other, all can be examined only in a book-length account of Heideggerian thought. But Heidegger's observation on the relationship of the individual to what seems uncomfortably like a Volksgemeinschaft or ethnic people's community, so central to German reactionary and national socialist moods, is too compelling to ignore. Destiny is how we designate the historicizing of the community of Evoke, Heidegger tells us in Being and Time, nor is destiny something that puts itself together out of individual fates, any more than being with one another can be conceived as the occurring together of several subjects. Our fates have already been guided in advance, in our being with one another in the same world and in our resoluteness for definite possibilities. Indeed, as Heidegger adds a few paragraphs later, given the authentic repetition of a possibility that has been, 
the possibility that Dasein may choose its hero, is grounded existentially in anticipatory resoluteness. Note. Heidegger, Being, and Time, pages 436, 437, emphasis added. The Macquarie and Robinson translation renders Heidegger's world vogue as people, which is usually how Men's Chen is translated. In view of the deeply ethnic implications of Vogue, especially in the context of Heidegger's historicizing of the German community, the use of people softens and neutralizes Heidegger's disturbing meaning. End note. In such passages Heidegger is already as early as in being and time, insinuating a leadership principle into his ontology. What is unambiguous is that he is a reactionary elitist, for whom the they, bluntly the Nietzschean herd, is the inauthentic raw material of the authentic few, most notably the German reactionary mandarins who are guided by conscience, guilt, care, and a heroic stance toward the certainty of death. In an outstanding study of the relationship of Heidegger's ontology to his political philosophy Richard Vallin observes that, following Heidegger's thought, the they, or, quote, those who dwell in the public sphere of everydayness are viewed as essentially incapable of self-rule. Instead, the only viable political philosophy that follows from this standpoint would be brazenly elitist, since the majority of citizens remain incapable of leading meaningful lives when left to their own devices, their only hope for redemption lies in the imposition of a higher spiritual mission from above. End note. Note. Richard Vallin, The Politics of Being, The Political Thought of Martin Heidegger, New York, Columbia University Press, 1990, p. 46. End note. Notoriously Heidegger became a fervent member of the National Socialist Party in 1933 and remained one until the collapse of the Third Reich. Notoriously too, whatever differences he may have had with more dogmatic approaches to Nazism, he tried to elevate it by enlarging its spiritual mission, albeit still retaining much of its folk philosophy. To deny this part of Heidegger's life and philosophy is totally unjustified in the light of what is now known about his own cynical attempts to conceal his past. Nor did he show any contrition after the war for his membership in the Nazi party. His failure to confront the show or Holocaust, or even to acknowledge its distinctiveness, is beneath contempt, as are his contrived excuses for removing his original dedication of being and time to Edmund Husserl, his former mentor was Jewish, and for his own silence upon Husserl's death in 1936. Indeed, during the 30s, after he entered the National Socialist Party his philosophy began to acquire an increasingly anti-humanistic, abstract, and essentially superhuman form. Thus, in being and time, being can only manifest itself through man, or Dasein, which, unlike all other entities, has a capacity to understand being. By the 1930s, Heidegger's conception of Dasein as an individual phenomenon vaporizes into a collective and essentially vokish concept, and being acquires a quasi-mystical autonomy. In a pithy and insightful interpretation of Heidegger's turn, care, in the mid-1930s and the 1940s, Richard Vallin observes that the thought of the later Heidegger, quote, appears at times to be a summary justification of human passivity and inaction, Glassenheit. Being assumes the character of an omnipotent primal force, a first unmoved mover of function that Aristotle assigned to his ontological god, whose presencing proves to be the determinative, ultimate instance for events in the lowly world of human affairs in its otherworldly supremacy, this force both withdraws from the tribunal of human reason and defies the meager capacities of human description, a being that not only surpasses all beings, and thus all men but which like an unknown God rests and essences in its own truth, in that it is sometimes present and sometimes absent, can never be explained like a being in existence, instead it can only be evoked. End quote. Note. Vallin, Politics of Being, p. 147. Vallin's quotation is of an appraisal by Karl Lowit in Heidegger, Denker in Duiftiger Zeit published in 1984. At the time of writing, Loita's book has not been translated into English, but some of his important accounts of his former teacher are translated in an invaluable selection of Heidegger's texts and comments by critics and former students of the master, 
under the title, The Heidegger Controversy, a critical reader, ed. Richard Vallin, Cambridge, Ma, MIT Press, 1993. Vallin's preface and introduction are compelling commentaries on Heidegger and one of his foremost French admirers, Jacques Derrida. End note. The collapse of the Third Reich did not eliminate Heidegger's lingering loyalty to the spiritual mission of the National Revolution, as Hitler's ascent to power was called by its adherents, and his emphasis on National Socialism's regenerative spiritual potentialities, as distinguished from its very secular performance, gave Heidegger a great deal of legitimacy among his later French and English-speaking sycophants. It is hard to tell whether Heidegger was a naive trapped in a misguided skein of fascist intrigue and betrayal or whether his French admirers decided to behave like naives trapped in an unsavory admiration for the former rector of Freiburg University. Rambunctiously fascistic and nationalistic in his speeches and lectures during the early 1930s, Heidegger's metaphysics now acquired a more restful, indeed fatalistic tone, turning to poetry particularly Holderlin's, the ontogenetic role of language, and philosophical allusions to a quietism that are redolent of Asian theisms. His post-war writings were permeated by mysticism, indeed by an apocalyptic theism. In an interview he gave to the German weekly Der Spiegel in September 1966, on the condition that it be published posthumously, he confronted the threat of the technological state and philosophy's role in resisting its encroachment with the following conclusions, quote, if I may answer quickly and perhaps somewhat vehemently, but from long reflection, philosophy will not be able to bring about a direct change of the present state of the world. This is true not only of philosophy but of all merely human meditations and endeavors. Only a God can save us. I think the only possibility of salvation left to us is to prepare readiness through thinking and poetry or the appearance of the God or for the absence of the God during the decline, so that we do not, simply put, die meaningless deaths, but that when we decline, we decline in the face of the absent God. End quote. Note. Martin Heidegger, Nut noch ein Gott hon uns retten only a God can save us, interview by Rudolf Augstein and George Wolfe, September 23, 1966. The interview was published in Der Spiegel ten years later, on May 11, 1976, shortly after Heidegger's death. The English translation is in Gunther Nesk and Emil Kettering, Martin Heidegger and National Socialism, Questions and Answers, New York, Paragon House 1990, pages 56-7, emphasis added. The book is a collection of documents and comments by apologists and critics of Heidegger. End note. In a sense, the interview was Heidegger's testament, and also a fascinating clarification of his views which can be traced back even to being and time. It is often safer to take Heidegger's statements at face value than to rely on his exegetists to adorn them with overloaded interpretations that remove us from the essential meaning of his words, a solution, to be sure, that would bankrupt many commentators on Heidegger who have managed to render his works and postmodernism a hermetic world accessible only to devout initiates. The entry of French post-war philosophers into the murky waters of Heideggerian thought was a disaster to serious reflection, and we are still bearing the burden they imposed as the century nears its end. Whatever Nietzsche and Heidegger wrote, their French admirers ratcheted up to even more obscure, and in many respects, more anti-modern levels than the two Germans achieved, albeit short of turning to fascism and nationalism. One of the most vexing members of this crew is Jacques Derrida, whose use of Heidegger left a trail of wreckage in Anglo-American literary criticism that has also passed over into social thought. An indefatigable writer and lecturer with an enormous following, Derrida has made paradox, contradiction, linguistic juggling, and inchoate thinking into virtues. Many of his verbal gymnastics derive from Heidegger, although he cannot be denied the responsibility for generating considerable confusion in his own right. To enter into the Derridean skein of criss-crossing ideas, assertions, inscriptions, and convoluted horizons, spaces, and self-indulgent queries that, in my view, muddle rather than clarify a viewpoint is beyond the scope of this book. Indeed, more than one book would be needed to give Derrida his due, 
and I do not mean this in any complimentary sense. The relationship of Derrida to Heidegger has been meticulously chronicled, step by step and word by word, in an essay by Charles Spinoza. Note. Charles Spinoza, Derrida, and Heidegger, Iterability and Erinus, in Hubert Dreyfus and Harrison Hall, eds. Heidegger, a critical reader, Oxford, Basil Blackwell, 1992, pages 270 to 97. Neither Spinoza's essay nor the book as a whole seems intended for the general reader, both presuppose a considerable familiarity with Heidegger and the topics that the various authors take up. End note. Despite his rather easygoing style Spinoza's comparison is demanding, and I shall do no more than take up the salient commonalities that he identifies. The conventional belief has been that Derrida's filiations with Heidegger began with Heidegger's turn from a more or less traditional ontology to explicit anti-humanism after the war, yet Spinoza shows quite inadvertently that being and time feeds as much into Derrida's thinking as does Heidegger's very influential post-war anti-humanist essay The Question Concerning Technology, as well as other essays of the late 1940s and 1950s. This relationship is not simply an academic issue. Derrida has emphasized that in Being and Time, written in the late 1920s, and particularly in his 1930s writings, Heidegger was still tied to a metaphysics of presence, that is, a metaphysics of underlying foundations that characterized the traditional ontologies of Western philosophy from Plato and Aristotle to Hegel and even including Nietzsche. For Derrida, this metaphysics of presence constitutes the premises of humanism, anthropocentrism, science, and rationalism, which, yes, led ultimately to fascism. Indeed, if I read Derrida's analysis correctly National Socialism is a result of humanism, possibly even its apogee. Thus it is worth referring to one of Heidegger's more repulsive Nazi texts, most famously his self-assertion of the German university, the lecture he gave on assuming the rectorship of the University of Freiburg in 1933, to get a sense of what Derridians regard as Heidegger's explicit or latent humanism. Laced with references to spirit and the spiritual leadership that the university must undertake in serving the Third Reich, Heidegger's address actually pivots around a rejection of academic freedom as merely negative liberty and appeals for the more substantive claims of service by students that result from three bonds. All three are largely Hitlerian, the three bonds by the people to the destiny of the state, in spiritual mission, are equally primordial to the German essence. The three services that are from it, labor service, military service, and knowledge service, are equally necessary and of equal rank. Note. Martin Heidegger, The Self-Assertion of the German University, in Nesk and Kettering, Martin Heidegger, P11. End note. Nor was Heidegger free of the jingoistic and racist rhetoric of the time when he referred to spirit. He told his listeners, quote, Spirit is not empty cleverness, nor the noncommittal play of wit, nor the boundless drift of rational dissection, let alone world reason, spirit is the primordially attuned knowing resoluteness toward the essence of being. And the spiritual world of a people, Vogue, is not the superstructure of a culture any more than it is an armory filled with useful information and values, it is the power that most deeply preserves the people's earth and blood-bound strengths as the power that most deeply aroused and most profoundly shakes the people's existence. End quote. Note. Ebedem, P9. End note. It requires enormous credulity, or naivete, to regard such passages from the rect oral address as spiritual, still less as being in accord with the traditional, presumably humanistic metaphysics of spirit, rather, it is an odious exercise in fascist rhetoric. In their devastating account of the French Heideggerians gathered around Jacques Derrida, Luc Ferry, and Alain Renault observed that, confronted with the question of Heidegger's Nazism, they quote, have irrevocably chosen their side and found their concept through an extraordinary recommendation, if Heidegger was a Nazi, which no one now can dispute, it certainly was not because he condemned the world of democratic humanism and thus saw the appeal of a conservative revolution, and if, as one student of Derrida's Philippe Lacouille Labart Cooley asserts, Nazism is a humanism, sick, 
we should judge that the Heidegger of 1933 was naturally led to Nazism because he was still in the grip of a humanistic and spiritualistic tradition he had not yet adequately deconstructed, QED. End quote. Note. Luke Ferry and Alain Renault, Heidegger and Modernity, Translation Franklin Philip, Chicago and London, University of Chicago Press, 1990, p. 2. End note. In fact, Derrida's of spirit, Heidegger and the question bears out that Ferry and Renault have taken aim with considerable accuracy. Note. Jacques Derrida, of spirit, Heidegger and the question, Chicago, University of Chicago Press, 1989, pages 31 to 46. End note. Derrida's text begins with a tangled series of questions on the meaning of spirit, Geist, that leads the reader into an increasingly abstract discussion of the rect oral address. It requires no intellectual astuteness to see that, however much Heidegger used philosophical verbiage to give a high tone to his address, it was meant to serve the needs of the Nazi regime. This fact does not elude Derrida, but his comments on the address are marked by numerous equivocations, in which he seems to take Heidegger's manipulation of philosophical terms, particularly spirit, in a strictly philosophical sense. Accordingly Derrida observes that one could say that Heidegger spiritualizes National Socialism. And one could reproach him for this, as he will later reproach Nietzsche for having exalted the spirit of vengeance into a spirit of vengeance spiritualized to the highest point, as if Heidegger's words and Nietzsche's were of comparable significance in this connection and Heidegger were dealing essentially with philosophical issues in his rect oral address, but on the other hand, Derrida proceeds, treating both sides of the argument as if they were equally valid, quote. By taking the risk of spiritualizing Nazism, he might have been trying to absolve or save it by marking it with this affirmation, spirituality, science, questioning, etc. By the same token, this sets apart Heidegger's commitment and breaks an affiliation. This address seems no longer to belong simply to the ideological camp in which one appeals to obscure forces, forces which would not be spiritual, but natural, biological, racial, according to anything but spiritual interpretation of earth and blood. End quote. Note. Ebedim, P39, emphasis added. End note. This deconstruction of the address is all the more unsavory because Heidegger's address was eminently ideological and did appeal to these obscure forces, such as the people's earth and blood-bound strengths, even dignifying them with sweeping references to Plato, Greek philosophy Hegel, and General von Clausewitz, the theorist par excellence of German militarism. Note. Richard Vallin has examined the regressive implications of Derrida's interpretation of Heidegger's humanism with detail that I cannot duplicate here. See Vallin, Politics of Being, pages 156 to 60. End note. As to Heidegger's and Derrida's similarities, despite their different emphases, notably Heidegger's on the rural craftsman in his shop and Derrida's on language, the distinctions between the two are not particularly significant. Heidegger's notion of equipment, the tools, and techniques with which a craftsman works, corresponds to Derrida's notion of difference, or the way we linguistically understand definitions. Our understanding of phenomena depends on differences or contrasts in meanings such as true-slash-false real-slash-imaginary-discovered-slash-invented, and so forth. For Derrida, a signified concept is never present in and of itself. Indeed, Every concept is inscribed in a chain or in a system within which it refers to the other, to other concepts, by means of the systematic play of differences. Note. Jacques Derrida, France, 1968, in Margins of Philosophy, Chicago, University of Chicago Press, 1982, p. 11, emphasis added. End note. I will not belabor the way Heidegger's equipment and Derrida's difference converge in practice except to note that Derrida is only too conscious of their similarities in the closing pages of his essay Difference, and that we are not examining a post-turn or post-war Heidegger but the author of Being and Time himself. Spinoza goes on to show that Derrida's difference, quote, 
comes very close to Heidegger's notion of revealing, being, once we make adjustments for seeing things in terms of systems of differences instead of practices or components. No person controls difference. That would be like thinking that someone controls language. We might as well say that when, a new way of revealing is happening this amounts to putting Derrida's insight about difference into Heidegger's language. End quote. Note. Spinoza, Derrida, and Heidegger, pages 274, 275, emphasis added. End note. At times, in fact, Derrida seems to out Heidegger Heidegger. For it is not persons who control difference, still less society but, vaguely and impersonally, systems, thereby reifying beyond lived experience and history the way in which differences reveal themselves. Aside from the similarities between the two men, the differences between them are advances and retreats, clarifications and obfuscations, around their respective degrees of anti-humanism. Where Derrida, as of this writing, shares Heidegger's view that philosophy is the originating source of all our cultural achievements, and problems, he adds nothing to the basically idealistic claim that Heidegger made early in his career, when he saw metaphysics as the determining factor in human behavior. Although a good deal more can be written about the correspondences between Heidegger and Derrida, the parallel ends in the way that the two men focus on the other. In Heidegger's case the section on every being oneself as an individual, mb and the they or, shall we say, using Nietzschean language, the herd, addresses in being and time the leveling down process induced by the herd, with its later implications of an authentic elite and a hero. In Derrida's case the play of differences supposes, syntheses and referrals which forbid at any moment, or in any sense, that a simple element be present in and of itself, referring only to itself, so that no element can function as a sign without referring to another element. Note. Heidegger, Being, and Time, pages 163-8, Jacques Derrida, Semiology and Grammatology, Interview with Julia Kristeva, In Positions, Translation Alan Bass, 1972, Chicago, University of Chicago Press, 1981, p. 25. End note. In both cases, there does seem to be a leveling down process, be it accommodation to the they in Heidegger's case that leads to an elite or hero, or a link in the chain of differences in Derrida's case that are expanded into othernesses by the play of difference to include all that traditional philosophy tries to suppress by creating an ossifying metaphysics of presence with its forms, I priori categories, prime movers. Viewed from this abstract philosophical perspective, Derrida, like Foucault, exhibits a concern for the others that literally constitute the margins of philosophy. From a literary standpoint, this suppressed other includes the hidden meanings within a text, from a social standpoint, it includes the suppressed other, such as women, non-Western peoples, marginals, and the like, in both cases the victims of Western logocentrism. Deconstruction to cite the practice that Derrida brings to textual analyses, undermines logocentrism and an all-pervasive metaphysics of presence by revealing the element of difference, the hidden reference, whose exposure subverts the seeming coherence of a particular work. In Mankind, for example deconstruction finds traces of the repressed other, womankind, or perhaps kind as such, man or woman. Deconstruction decentres the privileged sign, say, man, that inscribes itself on a text. These privileged signs are continually undermined by radically unstable or marginal signs, undecidables, and very significantly by deferment, in which one sign always refers to other signs that are implicit in a given work, thereby destabilizing a text's logocentric claims to coherence. One can thus think of deconstruction as a sort of octopus whose arms are continually extending outward toward hidden or implicit others that serve to undermine the centrality of a text's structure and identity, indeed, a sort of free association, which allows the critic to wander unrestricted in any direction he or she chooses. Deconstruction is thus a formula, and practice, for incoherence in the name of in-depth critique. Imminent critique, to be sure, is eminently desirable as long as it is not arbitrary. 
but by virtue of its anti-logocentrism, deconstruction can mean almost anything. In current usage it can range from the most flippant criticisms to almost incomprehensible metaphysical analyses. In 1968, Derrida himself described it in apocalyptic terms, when apocalypses were highly fashionable after which its meaning seems to have aged with time from a radical trembling to a fatalistic recognition that Western rationalism is so completely with us, even in traces, that breaks are always, and fatally, reinscribed in an old cloth that must continually, interminably be undone. Note. Derrida, Semiology and Grammatology, p. 24. End note. By privileging the written text over speech, deconstruction removes the reader from the author of a work and places him or her completely in the hands of the interpreter, or at the mercy of Harold Fromm's invisible puppeteer. See Chapter 4. In fact, deconstruction so depersonalizes the text that it safely removes the reader from heated issues that are often raised in a literary work. Freed of that existential content, these deracinated writings can be coolly manipulated into any configuration one chooses like checker pieces on a blank board. Arthur C. Danto observes, quote, To treat philosophical texts after the manner of Derrida, simply as networks of reciprocal relationships, is precisely to put them at a distance from its readers so introversible as to make it impossible that they be about us in the way literature requires. They become simply artifacts made of words, with no references save internal ones or incidental external ones. And reading them becomes external, as though they had nothing to do with us, were merely there, intricately wrought composites of logical lacework, puzzling and pretty and pointless. End quote. Note. Arthur C. Danto, The Philosophical Disenfranchisement of Art, New York, Columbia University Press, 1986, p. 160. End note. Danto, if anything, is too kind to the Derridians and deconstructionists. Often deconstructionists subject the reader to a barrage of elusive questions, so characteristic of Derrida's own texts, that they turn from hortatory queries into unrestrained free association. In a pointed illustration of deconstruction at work, David Lehman shows how an eight-line elegiac poem expressing bereavement for the death of a girl, a slumber did my spirit seal, from the Lucy series by Wordsworth, was contorted by a prominent deconstructionist, J. Hillis Miller, into a drifting jargon-laden interpretation. The poem is short enough to be cited in full, A slumber did my spirit seal, I had no human fears, she seem a thing that could not feel the touch of earthly years. No motion has she now, no force, she neither hears nor sees, rolled round in earth's diurnal course with rocks and stones and trees. Not only does Miller treat this simple economical and touching poem as a play of tropes that leads to a suspension of fully rationalizable meaning in the experience of an aporia or boggling of the mind, I shall make no attempt to interpret this jargon, but as Lehman observes, Miller avers, quote, that the poem presents mother as against daughter or sister, or perhaps any female family member as against some woman from outside the family that is, mother, sister, or daughter as against mistress or wife, in short, incestuous desires against legitimate sexual feelings. For Miller insists that the poem is odder than it looks, stranger and more enigmatic than traditional interpretations allow. The poet's eye is absent in the poem's second stanza, Miller notes, perhaps the speaker has lost his selfhood as a consequence of Lucy's death. End quote. Note. David Lehman, Signs of the Times, Deconstruction and the Fall of Paul de Man, New York, Poseidon Press, 1991, pages 125 to 7. End note. Miller's free association continues, often quite arbitrarily until we lose complete sight of the text and find ourselves entangled in the etymological derivation of the name Lucy, it comes from the Latin root for light which allows Miller to take one final leap. The poem, he says, is an allegory of loss. But it is not a dead girl that Wordsworth mourns for, it is the lost source of light, the father-son as logos, as head power and fount of meaning. Note. Ebedem, 
pages 125 to 7. End note. We may or may not be dealing any longer with what Wordsworth wrote, but it is clear that we are completely in the hands of the critic. It remains to survey several other French leftist intellectuals who carved postmodernist niches for themselves after the failure of May June 1968. Jill Deleuze, an academic, and Félix Guattari, a leftist militant and practitioner of an experimental psychoanalytic clinic, bolted across the post-1968 firmament with a book they co-authored in 1972, Anti-Oedipus, Capitalism and Schizophrenia. Note. Jill Deleuze and Félix Guattari, Anti-Oedipus, Capitalism and Schizophrenia, Translation Robert Hurley, Mark Seam, and Helen R. Lane, New York, Viking Press, 1977. End note. It essentially melded elements in the works of Wilhelm Reich, R. D. Lang, David Cooper, Norman O. Brown, and Michel Foucault into an exploration of uses of sexuality for coercion and liberation, a theme that was already common in the English-speaking world of the 1960s and 1970s. In France this theme seems to have been relatively new, hence the encomia that the book received for its originality. The truth is that sexuality is everywhere, declaimed Deleuze and Guattari, as though the statement were extraordinary if not outrageous. Sexuality is not only physically polymorphous, it is socially polymorphous as well. Thus, Hitler got fascists sexually aroused, declare the two authors. Flags, nations, armies, banks get a lot of people aroused. A revolutionary machine is nothing if it does not acquire at least as much force as these coercive machines have for producing breaks and mobilizing flows. Note. Ebedem, P293. End note. These concepts are as close to Wilhelm Reich's as one can get without quoting from him directly. For Deleuze and Guattari, schizophrenia is more a social pathology than an intrafamilial one, an insight that, they claim, distinguishes them from Freud's mommy and daddy approach. The job of radical intellectuals is to probe this social domain that encompasses seemingly individual pathologies, but to do so on a micro-political level, indeed, one redolent of Henry Lefebvre's emphasis on L. E. Quotidian. A truly revolutionary movement must not be so preoccupied with larger social issues that it fails to release energy blockages in individual human desiring machines, especially if it is to provide a radical alternative to the sexual arousal produced by fascism, flags, nations, armies, and so on. Thus, Deleuze and Guattari contend, a revolutionary group at the preconscious level remains a subjugated group, even in seizing power, as long as this power itself refers to a form of force that continues to enslave and crush desiring production. Note. Ebedem, P348. End note. Having attained the conscious level of desiring production, however, it remains unclear how a revolutionary machine is to advance beyond a naive lifestyle anarchism, raging with desire and a libidinal sexual politics, and try to change society as a whole. This anti Oedipus badly needed another volume to address this problem. What its admirers got as a companion work, eight years later, 1980, was A Thousand Plateaus, adorned with the same subtitle as the previous book, Capitalism and Schizophrenia. Far from confronting the issues of social change, Deleuze and Guattari in this work ran riot in a self-indulgent exercise in literary styles, intellectual caprices, excursions into fields of trivia such as ticks and quilts and fuzzy subsets and noology and political economy, wrote the English translator, Brian Masumi, who warned the reader, it is difficult to know how to approach the book. Note. Jill Deleuze and Felix Guattari, a Thousand Plateaus, Capitalism and Schizophrenia, Translation Brian Masumi, 1980, Minneapolis, University of Minnesota Press, 1987, p. 9. End note. Leaving aside its complex technical vocabulary, as Masumi puts it with excessive civility, the authors recommend that you read it as you would listen to a record. Note. Ebedem End Note. In short,
the question of how to advance desiring machines along socially revolutionary lines was not answered. Instead, immunized to critical scrutiny by their language, style, and disorder, Delos and Guattari launched a typical postmodernist attack upon rational thinking and its intellectual consequences. Comparing reason to a tree, they challenged this long standing Western metaphor for knowledge that has roots, foundations, form, logic, and structure, coherence, opposing to it their own metaphor of the rhizome, which snakes along underground, putting out tendrils that evoke notions of multiplicity, heterogeneity, decenteredness, formlessness, in effect, incoherence. This rhizomatic imagery and method brings us back to Foucault, whose microanalyses tend to dissolve history into episodes and discontinuous events. Not surprisingly Foucault wrote a warmly approving introduction to Anti-Oedipus. Around the same time that Anti-Oedipus was causing a stir in France, Jean-Francois Lyotard also began to shine in the postmodernist world. Even more dogmatic than Guattari as a leftist, who was an avowed autonomist, Lyotard migrated from the Sotilisme OU Barbary group to the dogmatic workers' power during the 1968 evenements. After his enthusiasm for the marginal in the left diminished, he decided to abandon the proletarian revolution for academic postmodernism. Lyotard's positions in this new incarnation have undergone so many changes that the differences between him and Derrida are now minimal, in my view. No less a deconstructionist than Derrida in fields that range beyond literature, Lyotard created his own grammatology out of a combination of Nietzsche and Wittgenstein, laced with Paul Feyerabend's chaotic epistemological anarchism. It is not very fruitful to examine how Lyotard's pragmatics of language yield the not particularly startling conclusion that to speak is to fight. Note. Jean-Francois Lyotard, The Postmodern Condition, A Report on Knowledge, Translation Jeff Bennington and Brian Masumi, Minneapolis, University of Minnesota Press, 1984, p. 10. End note. More important, for our purposes, is that Lyotard exhibits a sturdy hostility to reason, objectivity and truth. All events are really narratives, their objectivity consists in whether we commit them to paper as a narrative or not. In one dialogue with himself, the voice I will call Lyotard I declares, when I tell my story, I am not acting as a mouthpiece for some universal history. And I make no claim to being a professional theorist, or to be saving the world by reminding it of a lost meaning. What, the second voice, Lyotard II, exclaims. So the Paris Commune, Kronstadt, and Budapest in 56 are just stories. And what about the people who died? Lyotard I dismisses this complaint with the observation, the dead aren't dead until the living have recorded their deaths in narratives. Death is a matter of archives. You are dead when stories are told about you, and when only stories are told about you. And you are free to expand the archive as much as you like, by including in it even the most anodyne of documents. Note. Jean-Francois Lyotard, Lessons in Paganism, in Andrew Benjamin, ed. The Lyotard Reader, Oxford, Basil Blackwell, 1989, p. 126. Kronstadt is a reference to Kronstadt, the site of the Red Sailors' revolt against the Bolsheviks in 1921. End note. Events are simply stories, theories are merely concealed narratives, narratives that presumably require deconstruction, and we should not be taken by their claims to be valid for all time, as though such claims are usually voiced. This Nietzschean perspectivist view of events and theories is a commonplace in the postmodernist world and leads to agonistic duels between various texts rather than explorations of reality. Like Lyotard, Jean Baudrillard is an academic of the French left. He essentially expanded Marx's theory of commodity fetishism into a critique of the consumer society, with its psychologically overwhelming media imagery and spectacles. Capitalist commodities, according to Baudrillard, produce a hyper-civilization of signs, a symbolic realm of sign values, which supplements Marx's economically oriented realm of exchange values. Indeed, sign values may involve not only symbolic intangibles but the exchange of looks, the present which comes and goes, 
prodigality festival, and also destruction, which returns to non-value what production has erected, valorized. Note. Jean Baudrillard, for a critique of the political economy of the sign, St. Louis, Telos Press, 1981, p. 207, and note. By removing symbolic exchange, according to Baudrillard, society can undermine the strictly productivist logic of capitalism. By the late 1970s, Baudrillard was describing our era as a time of simulations, in which signs acquire a life of their own and come to dominate social life. The real is replaced by its image or simulation, as in television dramas, where actors who play doctors and detectives are solicited for technical advice. Hyperreality replaces reality, indeed, borrowing a word from Marshall McLuhan, images are imploded into collages, and advertising saturates the media to the point where images, racing one after the other on television programs, form a dazzling and deadening blur. In the face of simulations that take over their lives people become enervated and apathetic, such that this implosion contracts experience into imagery that renders once prized mores and political ideas meaningless. In the end, Baudrillard is so overtaken by his notion of the implosion of simulations that, as he claims, power itself undergoes a metamorphosis into signs and is invented on the basis of signs. Note. Jean Baudrillard, Forget Foucault, New York, Simeo Text E, 1987, p. 58, emphasis added. End note. It may well be that Baudrillard was being overtaken by his own discussion of simulations and was becoming absorbed into the implosion he explored. In any case he calls for a decentering of power so radical that even the micropolitics of Delos and Guattari were insufficiently molecular. Finally in his later writings, his absorption into the world of simulations is really completed, with the result that his work is now part of the very constellation of images that bombard us today. Having jettisoned even symbolic exchange as a social desideratum, Baudrillard ends up with an arid nihilism. If being a nihilist is to be obsessed with the mode of disappearance, and no longer with the mode of production, then I am a nihilist, he declaimed in the mid-1980s. Disappearance, aphonesis, implosion, fury of the Verschwind and the disappearing. Note. Jean Baudrillard, on nihilism, on the beach, number 6, spring 1984, cited in Douglas Kellner Jean Baudrillard, from Marxism to Postmodernism and Beyond, Stanford, Stanford University Press, 1989, pages 118, 119. End note. But a radical nihilism that once challenged the social order, he observes, is utopia. The system itself is also nihilist, in the sense that it has the power to reverse everything in indifferentiation, including that which denies it. Note. Baudrillard, on nihilism. End note. This passage, which Douglas Kellner has called a cul-de-sac, did not mark the end of Baudrillard's voyage into the hyperreal. Note. Kellner, Baudrillard, p. 119. End note. But in my view this cul-de-sac tells us all we need to know about the frivolities of postmodernist philosophy, if we can dignify postmodernism by regarding it as a philosophy.